Uh, so Lisa's here from Glasgow, where she directs the Face Perception Lab. Um, in addition to her work in meta science and uh, open science, Lisa's authored something like 180 papers, I think, on face perception and uh, social perception. Uh, so, and that's going to be a, a common theme with our speakers this morning, who are sort of having a day job as an experimental or uh, social psychologist, and then a sort of um, moonlight job doing open science. So we're really excited to hear from Lisa and uh, about her work on everything. Okay. So the first time I gave this talk was in November, well before I knew about the whole Danish thing. It's been Lego themed always, but um, yeah. So I'm going to give you a Lego themed tour of um, large scale collaboration and um, how it might help us to address some of the problems that we talked about yesterday. But I want to start out with a thank you slide because none of this would be possible without at least, well, without hundreds of people who I'm going to thank in the slide where the names are so small that you can't see them. But these three people in particular, um, Ben Jones, who runs the Face Research Lab with me in Glasgow, um, and is also a co-author on the first like, science accelerator study. Jess Flake, who um, is a methodologist with the PSA, um, and who's been subsequently invited to um, be on the core team for the first study. And Chris Charte, who's the director of the Psychological Science Accelerator. And I'll talk about all of them more. But first, replication. So we talked a lot yesterday about replication, its importance. Um, and I really like this slide from it's, Chris Chambers tends to present this in his talks. It's available at um, Open Science Framework, the Center for Open Science. Every slide's going to have um, random URLs in the corner, but the, the one on the first slide, which we'll come back in a minute, is the whole talk. And feel free to use and reuse anything from this talk. But so we know, the, the hypothetical deductive model, this idealized view of um, how we do research, can really be derailed by a number of um, questionable research practices. So many of the studies that we run have low statistical power, um, having you know, only a 50% chance to detect medium effects. We've got really poor power to detect the kind of effects you tend to see in, say, social or cognitive psychology. Um, prevalence of p-hacking, sometimes estimated to be 50 to 100%. I'm not sure we have great data on that, actually. Um, but again, <coughs> stops us from being able to interpret the literature as a whole body. Understanding what p-values are meant to, to tell us is totally derailed by some of the practices we have around this. Publication bias, lack of data sharing. We can't check things. We can't tell what's missing in the literature. And then lack of replication. Far from this potential world where there's 85% raise, we've got maybe 0.1% raise. Only maybe one out of 1,000 papers is ever replicated in literature. So how do we combat this? I'm going to zoom through this pretty fast because it touches on what people have talked about yesterday and what Zoltan is going to talk about later. Um, but one of the big things I want to encourage people to do is data, code, and preprint sharing. Okay, so Britta talked a lot about this yesterday. Um, some places that can help you do that. I think many of you already know about these tools. But one thing I want to kind of advocate as well um, is code books. So sharing your data, sharing your code is nice. But if people look at it and they have no idea what are all those columns, <laughs> what is column 19 that's labeled V underscore F underscore 01? I don't know. And you probably won't know again in five years either. Um, yes, as mentioned, my, the 180 papers that I've co-authored with many other people, I've been going through a project to looking back, trying to replicate my analyses from stuff I did during my PhD, and oh my goodness, is it hard. I have no idea what I meant by a lot of that stuff. So code books, giving yourself as much information as possible so future you has a clue what you're doing. Um, there was a project started at SIPS last year it's turned into um, we call it PsychDS. It's um, Data Standards for Psychology. Um, integrates with Ruben Arslan's R Package Codebook. Um, you can find out more about it at that URL. Um, it's a project to try to make it really easy for everybody to run their data files through either a web interface or with the um, codebook um, package and generate useful codebooks that give you metadata about your study. 
And this is something that we're integrating with the Psych Science Accelerator as well, so all studies in the Psych Science Accelerator will be using these standards. Okay. Reproducible workflows is another thing that can help us tackle these problems with the experimental cycle. Um, so Britta talked about Binder yesterday, which might even be better than Code Ocean, um, which is, again, a kind of closed resource. But there are a few different resources for packaging up all of your, your whole workflow so that um, the packages you use, the versions that you use, your data, everything's encapsulated and can run exactly as it ran, um, which doesn't seem like a problem right now, but hopefully you'll all live more than 10 years. And in 10 years, you're not going to be able to find the operating system you, you did stuff with or the packages you were working with in the versions that they existed in previously. I'm going to really fast through pre-registration because we've talked about it a lot. Um, but there's a, a few places that can help you, walk you through a pre-registration. Just simply saying what it is you're, you're going to do as a plan, not a prison. Um, and things change, and they always change. Pre-registrations um, are almost never executed exactly as, as planned. Um, and simply letting the scientific record see what did you plan, what went differently, and why did you change it? As transparently as possible, I think, can only help us. Um, there's a lot of OSF templates for pre-registration, so pre-registration isn't entirely just for experimental studies, although um, it does seem more tailored specifically to experimental studies. But there's people working on pre-registration templates for qualitative research, for secondary data, um, and for things like fMRI now. Um, this is where I normally talk about registered reports, but I'm going to skip through that because Zoltan is going to talk about registered reports in great detail in an hour. Um, but I think registered reports are, are an idealized version of um, pre-registration where you get feedback from your scientific peers on your pre-registered plan and then with them develop um, a plan that you execute and if, it, if things don't go to plan, you can um, talk with them and decide what it, what's sensible to do and also have um, assurance that your, your data will be published no matter what you find. So again, addressing this file drawer problem. But the, the thing I want to talk about that maybe hasn't been touched on so much so far in this workshop is the problem of generalization. Um, Joachim talked about a little bit with robustness, but how do we know that the findings that we get in our lab in Glasgow with Scottish and European undergraduates are going to generalize to, say, a lab in Edinburgh with Scottish and English undergraduates. Even that we're not entirely sure about. And then we have the wider problem of will they generalize to non-student populations, to populations in other countries, to populations in um, non-westernized societies. Um, so we know a lot, a lot about psychology undergrads. Um, you know, maybe some of you are in fields where this is not a giant problem, but in social and cognitive psychology, most of what we know is about people who are between kind of 17 and 23 years old, and they tend to live in an industrialized society, and they tend to be relatively wealthy. In fact, we've even got an acronym for it. Probably most of you have heard this, but they do tend to be Western and educated, they're university students, um, industrialized, rich relative to the rest of the world. It's actually really difficult to find rich Legos. Um, so you end up with Batman in his money pajamas. Um, and from relatively democratic societies, um, depending on how you define democracy. So, but people have put this together in an acronym Weird. Um, it's weird societies, we are all weird. And actually, the vast majority of humans are not weird. The vast majority of humans throughout history, our ancestors, were not weird. If we want to, especially as an evolutionary psychologist, trying to think about human nature or the, the conditions under which our behavior evolved, they weren't these conditions. So, depending on what your question is, your question might just be about, like, Specifically, how do university undergraduate students think about X? Then fine, you can use them. But if not, we maybe need to reach out a bit more than our typical sample. But this is hard, right? There's a reason that we all study undergraduates, and it's not because they're 
super ideal population and the only population we care about. It's because they're here. Um, so one of the main ways we might be able to address this is with collaboration. So getting researchers from all over the world with different um, resources, different access, to pool their resources and be able to look at people from different places. Now there's other replication projects that have, have started to look at this. Um, and I don't want to say PSA isn't the only one or the best one. Um, so I want to mention some of those projects, like the many labs, one, two, three, and four. There's now many babies. There's many primates. There's many, many things now. Um, this pipeline project, the human penguin project is a large scale collaboration. Um, registered replication reports. So this is not the only one. Lots of people have come up with this idea. But what most of those have in common is that they're groups of researchers who are interested in a specific problem or a specific research question. They come together, develop their methods, do their studies in multiple places, and then the project kind of dissolves. Um, oh, the, oh, sorry, there's one more I wanted to talk about. Is the, um, another large-scale collaboration is the crepe. Um, it rhymes with grape. It's a metaphor. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met the people in charge of the crepe, but they're really insistent. It's not crap. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm not even going to tell you about the metaphor because I, I mess it up every time. But it, 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 it has something to do with individual grapes being genetically the same, but they end up different because of the environment. And so if you do lots of different replications, well, here I am explaining the metaphor, um, <laughs> then much like Joachim's talk, you can maybe see what are the... Um, theoretically irrelevant differences that are due to differences in the environment, and then pick out what is the kind of essence of the grapevine. Oh no, I'm getting even worse with the metaphor now. <laughs> but um, the crepe is a student project. So um, they pick a few different research projects every year, um, and then you can sign up with your students to, um, to run the projects as, as an undergraduate project. They collect data. Um, have to videotape their procedures to ensure that things um, are actually running as planned so people can check and see um, are all the different replicates actually replicates. Um, and then you have the option to contribute, or you have to contribute your data towards the um, overall group project, but you have the option to also be a co-author on the paper that comes out of that project. I think they've got one paper published and two in press now. Um, and the, the crepe has a PSA branch, so there's an accelerated crepe. I'm not quite sure how it's accelerated, but you can learn more about it at that URL. But so the main thing I want to talk to you today about is the Psych Science Accelerator. Um, so in contrast with the sort of many labs, many, many things projects, the Psych Science Accelerator is meant to be um, an amalgamator, um, an overarching umbrella organization that learns how to do these um, large-scale collaborative projects and then provides resources to teams or to proposers who propose different projects and hopefully will be a long-term standing network of um, researchers who are interested in being involved in large-scale projects or have specific expertise um, in aspects of these projects that, that require expertise. So, the metaphor here is it's sort of like a CERN for psychological science. Um, and so this, our, our, the origin story is it all started with a tweet from Chris Chartier. Uh, he was just kind of speculating. He wrote a blog post and tweeted that maybe we should start building a CERN for psychological science. Um, and a few people responded to it. Well, it was retweeted 48 times and liked by 81 people. Um, but a few people, including me, emailed him and said, this is a really good idea. This is really interesting, and here are some skills that I have that I'd like to contribute to the project. <laughs> and we thought maybe we'd recruit 10 or 15 labs over the next year who'd be interested and try to start building this network. Um, it's been going for 18 months. In the first 365 days, we recruited 364 labs, slightly disappointingly. Um, but now we're over 400 labs in 50 countries. There's been 
a lot more interest than anybody ever thought. Um, and we've, they've got a, a live shiny app map if you want to keep up to date with exactly where everybody is. Um, well, if Google Maps can correctly translate what people are putting into the Google Forms. But um, so PSA, it's lots of labs, but how are we organized? What are we doing? We've, um, we've spent a while trying to figure that out. And right now, um, we are, what is that, 12-ish teams of, um, or organizing teams. So leadership team tries to figure out what we're doing, which we'd really never know. Um, logistics, there are so many logistics to figure out. How do we, um, well, we don't really have any money yet. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, there's a, a big training component. So this isn't just um, a group of scientists trying to get people in non-weird countries to run studies for them. And there's a real ethos of um, wanting to give back training. There needs to be a reason for people to be involved. They need to get something out of it, not just contribute participants to it and then get 97th co-authorship. Um, so there's a, a training arm that's looking at how, to, how do we um, get best science practices taught to people. Um, our funding group, study selection is probably the thing that you guys might be most interested in, like how do I get a study run by the PSA? So I'll talk about that in detail in a minute. Um, ethics is super tricky, super tricky to get the exact same protocol through 165 different ethics boards. Um, so we've got a whole committee working on that problem, and we've been mostly solving it, but again, quite tricky. Um, our project management group is just a team of absolutely awesome project managers. One gets assigned to every, um, every individual study, and then they wrangle people. The project that I'm running, um, we're, I'm wrangled by Nicholas Cole, who is utterly amazing and just always keeping me on track and keeping every, all 167 labs involved in the study on track. What many people in this room might be interested in, though, is may, like maybe you don't have access to data collection, anything, but this is an interesting project. I'd like to be involved. We've got um, methods analysis team and the data management team. So teams trying to figure out how is it that, um, say, how is it that we're going to actually manage all of this data? Um, how are we going to share data when appropriate, figure out what's appropriate or inappropriate to share, um, how, who gets access to the data when, um, and also consulting on methods and analysis. So Jess Flake is a great example of she's somebody from the methods team who had such important input into study one that she's been put onto the, the study one um, lead authorship team. So there's lots of room in the methods and analysis team for people to contribute if they have special skills. Um, and then our community building and translation, I'll talk about a bit more later. <coughs> okay, so study proposals. Um, there's a paper on SciArchive that I think went up published in AMPS um, that outlines the whole, how the PSA worked about a year ago. Again, it's continually changing, but um, this is the basic idea of how we um, do study proposals. So we do a registered report format for proposals. And you write out a um, brief introduction explaining why it's an interesting question, what's the background to it, um, detailed methods, and ideally a detailed results plan that includes code. Um, but again, our training team is there if you don't know how to um, translate your, your plan into code to help you with that. Um, it's reviewed by about 10 researchers. Some will be PSA members, some won't be. There might be some dis disciplinary specialists um, and some generalists. So it gets quite a lot of um, detailed review. Um, and so that's in the sort of first four weeks after the submission, it's looked at by these people. They write um, brief outlines for the general PSA members so they can read what the reviewers think. and then all the members of the PSA get to vote on what do they think about um, each of the proposed <coughs> projects. And then it goes to um, the study selection committee who look at the detailed reviews and the member votes. Because even if the project is outstanding but none of the members want to be involved, then it's not going to fly. But 
vice versa, if um, all the members think something is awesome, but the expert reviewers say, actually, this is fundamentally problematic, we can't. Um, <coughs> so that's, and the, the second four weeks, that panel evaluation happens. Um, and then the director will provide feedback on all of the accepted and rejected um, papers, but the, um, the number of projects that are accepted in each round and how long between each round is really right now dependent on how many people are involved in the PSA, what's our capacity. Um, since we're growing so fast, we thought we'd do maybe one or two projects in the first year and we've got six on the go now. So it's going fast, faster than I think is um, reasonable. But um, said so the director has boundless enthusiasm. <laughs> um, all right, so after a project is accepted, then you start to get input from the methods, ethics, translation, the data management teams. Um, because no matter how good the proposal, you, there's probably a bunch of things you haven't thought of. Um, and then especially the, um, the methods team will often propose, say, robustness checks that you might not have thought of. Um, will help you with power analyses for um, the registered report version that will be submitted to a journal. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> sorry. So during project development, um, you produce a registered report. So the core team writes the report, and during that time, you sign up um, interested labs in the network. So not everybody has to. Um, not every lab is going to be involved in every project. So only labs that are interested in this project have capacity at the, the time of year that you're planning on collecting data um, will probably sign up. And you can also sign up external labs. There are a lot of people involved in Steady One that I'm running who are um, face research labs who probably won't continue on with the PSA or just interested in this project. But other people who are kind of generalists and are interested in running anything. Um, so you sign up labs start to prepare ethics um, applications and get them out to the labs, and then write the registered report. Um, and then you get the community feedback. So all the labs who are involved will feedback on the registered report um, and feedback on the methods. And this is a bit of an iterative process. And it can, it can take a little bit of time, um, but it depends on how straightforward your project is, how many people are involved, and how argumentative they are. Um, so after a stage one registered report is then completed to everybody's satisfaction, it's submitted to a journal, hopefully accepted. Um, we have one study right now that's um, going to go ahead because the, um, the authors decided not to submit a, a registered report, but are going to do, um, they're going to submit a results blind um, manuscript instead. So. Um, but after the registered report is accepted or some other process is decided, then you start data, um, data collection. Um, and we're planning a phased data release for most things, although um, our procedures aren't 100% worked out right now. But the idea is that PSA members will have kind of first viewing of um, what's going on with the data set, where are the parameters, um, and look at, say, training data sets or simulated data sets. Um, <coughs> with giving them a chance to, say, maybe pre-register additional analyses before the full data set's released to everybody. Um, and then the full data set will be released either in a staged way, so with training sets to the wider public, and then the full set, or simulated data sets released to the wider public, and then the full data set. And once the registered report's published, obviously the full data set will be, will be available to everybody everywhere. All right. so. Just give you a um, kind of concrete walkthrough on one of the projects. This is the project that um, I'm leading with Ben Jones and Jess Flake. Um, it's on social perception of faces around the world. So I don't know how many of you are kind of social perception researchers, probably none. So I'll go through the, um, what we're doing is testing the valence dominance model. This is a really influential model in social perception of how do we do first impressions? Like when you look at somebody, you decide, do they look trustworthy or agreeable or dominant or attractive or what? Like we all make these judgments. They're super inaccurate. They, don't have, om they have almost nothing to do with people's actual behavior. But people do them. And the um, kind of underlying structure of how we're making these judgments is um, 
well, explained in this paper. So what they did was ask a bunch of people, like, when you look at a face, like, what, how do you, what can you tell about this person? And they came up with 13 things that um, multiple people nominated, traits that they were judging faces on. Not sure who's judging faces on weirdness. This is not the weird, like, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. This is just strange. Um, but so, and then they had um, people rate a big batch of poser faces, like computer generated faces, on these 13 adjectives and determined that the, the structure of judgments um, could really be boiled down to um, a valence dimension and a dominance dimension. If interpreted this as valence is kind of how much does this person want to help or hurt you, and dominance is how much can this person help or harm you. Now, these findings have been well replicated in the US in Princeton and again in Princeton, um, but also in Glasgow and in St. Andrews in the UK. Um, so, some, yeah, good replication. Not great generalization, though. Um, so, a PhD student in my lab, Hong Yi Wang, um, repeated this entire procedure in China with Chinese participants, Chinese faces. They came up with um, adjectives there. Um, another researcher used the same adjectives um, that Tarov used but translated into Chinese. And they both found the same thing that um, this. The underlying factor structure of social judgments was totally different in China than in the UK and in the US. Um, although there was a sort of valence dimension as the, the first dimension of social perception, there was no hint of dominance being important in social perception at all. And instead, there was a sort of intelligence or competence dimension. So we've got our black swan. It's not universal. But what's, what's the actual pattern around the world? Since most social perception research is built now on the kind of underlying assumption that there's a valence dimension, a dominance dimension. People don't even rate other things. You just rate trustworthiness, which correlates best with valence, and dominance, which correlates best with dominance. And leave it at that, because obviously those are the only two things that matter. But we just don't know how well does this generalize. So that's why um, Ben and I proposed to run this study in as many places as we can. Um, so these are the. Countries that were signed up when I made this slide in November, I think we've got about five more, but I don't remember who they are. Um, but so we've got, um, we're dividing the world into world regions based on the World Health Organization um, divisions, plus a few other divisions like split out um, Central America and lumped with Mexico and split out the US and Canada. And then the UK is its own region all by itself because there's just so many labs there. Um, but again, the data will be available for you to um, divide the regions into anything you want to. This is the after the um, registered report was reviewed by some experts in the area. These were the regions that they thought were really interesting. We're going to have at least 350 raters per world region, um, which will give us more than 9,000 participants in total. It's looks like, looking like we're going to well exceed that. We've got more than 5,000 participants already run in the study. Um, OK, so what are they doing? We're just going to look at faces from the Chicago face database. So we're not going to use computer generated faces for this one, because uh, I'm, I'm more interested in what people are actually doing. And they don't actually interact with computer generated faces that much yet. Um, luckily, and I think this is why um, the proposal was chosen as the first proposal um, to run in the PSA is the procedure is really simple. Like people just look at a screen and they click a button, one to seven, how, whatever. So this one's how sociable. Um, because of some translation issues, we decided to um, use brief definitions as well as the exact adjective. Well, the original research um, just used how sociable is this person? How weird is this person? Um, that we'd define these terms a little bit more carefully so that when translated, we could be more sure that the translations were, had equivalent connotations. Um, and what is this? Is this Dutch? Yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> it's this one. It's, it's Turkish. Awesome. Um, so we've, we've got 22 languages translated right now. Um, our translation team. 
scientists are amazing. All teams, <laughs> multiple teams are amazing. Um, so the process that we've adopted, and it's based on, um, there's some papers that I can't, can't recall, but I don't know. Check that link. That link might help. Um, I guess, um, it's set out this procedure. But so you get a, a team of five academics. There's one coordinator, two um, native speakers translate from um, English to the target language, two researchers translate back from the target language to English, all five of the academics discuss any discrepancies and come up with one final version. That version is then sent to two lay people, non academics who are native speakers of the target language. Um, they explain to the team what they understand from all of the translated material. It's then revised again to make sure there's no misunderstandings, and then sent out to all the data collection labs um, for that language grouping. The data collection labs can then make any specific adjustments that they need for like local context, um, local dialects. So we've got, say, a few versions of French, a few versions of Portuguese. Um, so it's, we've got a, a pretty clear data translation process, I feel like. Each of these translation teams ought to get their own paper out of this because um, it's, it's an amazing amount of work that they do. And then they send me all of their um, translations in an Excel file, and then I wrestle with databases after that. But I've learned many things about the Thai alphabet. <laughs> um, all right. Also, the analysis team. So the analysis team um, helps you with power calculations, which are trickier than you thought. We actually now have a, a preprint of how to do the power calculations for how many raters do you need for reliable ratings for a thing. Um, because it's not actually a power calculation. You can just plop, plop into G power. Um, when you're doing principal components analysis, how do you calculate power for that? Um, we've actually had to generate new methods to, to do the power calculations for the registered report. Um, and that's been a really interesting aspect, I think. Um, and again, a bit of capacity building that as the PSA grows and matures, we'll have even better expertise. And I think that's a side project of generating methods papers. How do we solve these methodological problems? That as an individual researcher, you might just say, it's just too complicated. I cannot do power analysis for um, principal components analysis or for factor analysis. Um, the, for this particular project, because it's a replication of somebody else's research, we have exact replication analyses. So um, the original unrotated principal components analysis with the same parameters that you get out of SPSS um, and doing it exactly the same, which seems to be very important to people to be able to compare like with like. But then um, our analysis team said that these analyses are, are not right. They're not interpretable. So we have got loads of robustness checks um, also in this particular project trying to do the analysis right um, and see can we, you know, do we get the same results if we don't make the dodgy assumptions that SPSS puts on your PCA. Um, all right, so the registered report for this particular study took about four months start to end, um, but two weeks of that, Ben <gasps> Jones and I were um, on a beach in Barcelona, so you can't count those. Um, <coughs> So we had two rounds of review at Nature Human Behavior. Three reviewers, two of them were signed. One was Alex Tara from the original paper. Um, and the other one was Alex Jones, who's a face researcher in the UK. All three of them gave fantastic feedback. Um, I, I know you're going to talk about this soon, but I just cannot explain enough how, how great it is to um, have a big, complicated project and be able to talk with the reviewers before I've collected the data, before it's too late before I've already done the analysis and now I feel like they're p-hacking at me. Um, it, it was just so helpful and I think the, the project is so much better for having gone through this process. But again, only four months start to end and with a, a project this big that I, I don't think is, a, is unreasonable. <coughs> <coughs> All right, so status update. I had to look this up last night. We've got a, um, a very active Slack forum for the PSA. And um, so actually, I looked up again this morning, and it had changed. So we've got more than 70 labs completed. I've just put more then because these numbers um, are continuing throughout the day. There's probably at least one lab collecting data right now. Um, 127 of 165 signed up labs have ethics approval. Again, this 
Um, it's trickier than you think. Even just getting people to look at 120 faces and poke a button for rating, not every ethics committee is super happy with this. Um, and indeed, we've not been able to collect sexual orientation data on the participants because enough ethics boards said that that wasn't acceptable, that we decided in this instance to um, just remove it from the, the study. Um, but we're going to be looking into ways to um, let different labs collect different batches of questions depending on their local ethics and see how we can, we can use that in the future. Um, again, more than 5,000 participants have gone through the study. And we've got 22 of 30 languages translated. But this morning, they told me simplified Chinese is ready. So that's my task for tonight. Um, what is this? Oh, so I thought Chris Chambers sums it up really nicely. The, the benefits of this type of project and combating some of the, the questionable research practices, the problems that we have in the research cycle. Um, well. I'll leave it up to you whether or not you think it's an important question for theory, but in my discipline it is. Um, the rigorous methodology looked at by literally hundreds of people. Um, and again, all the stages um, in the registered report when we were preparing it, um, they were all public. So the PSA website um, has links to slightly poorly organized, but hopefully we'll get them better organized. But there are links there to the Google Documents. You all can go and look at everything that's happening, look at all of the Manuscripts give comments to the authors, so even people who aren't on um, the PSA team can usually see most of what's going on. Um, again, large sample, pre-registered, pre-printed. There's not going to be any publication bias because um, no matter what we find, they've committed to publishing it. And um, I'm going to tell you about the, the only real downside of large-scale collaboration. And you do need to think about this, especially if you're a um, a proposing author, because this will be your responsibility, is typing all of these names okay. into the nature human behavior interface, because you have to type them all in individually with their affiliations and their email addresses if you want to submit a paper. Um, yeah, so we're actually in talks with um, the OSF right now to figure out better ways to um, bulk upload, like for the, the SciArchive preprint. At least for that particular thing, can we bulk upload um, our authorship list? Because they're only going to get bigger. Um, but no, th this is, this is a, a joke downside. Um, it's tricky, and I, I think we've spelled a few of these names not exactly correctly, but we'll, we'll fix it in the end. Um, so to so let you know now, uh, update on kind of where's the PSA that this is the, um, the first project, but it's only one of six. So um, again, this, it's study one. It's accepted in principle acceptance at Nature Human Behavior, and we're doing data collection. Study two is on object orientation. Um, it'll be in 14 different language groups. Um, and it's an in principle acceptance at Psychonomic Bulletin and Review. And again, there's the um, links for all the preprints for these. Um, accelerated CREP, the first um, CREP project that was linked to the Psych Science Accelerator on Knowledge and Luck, got a revise and resubmit at AMPS, and also has a, a preprint up. <coughs> All right. Study three is the Gendered Prejudice Study, um, and this is the study that's going to do a results blind review, and it's running in um, parallel with study two. So we'll bundle together studies um, if it's possible to, to run them together on the same participants and make sense um, for both the studies and the amount of time. Study four on true beliefs is a revise and resubmit for the registered report at AMPS. So we're hopeful that one will be underway soon. Uh, so there's a stereotype threat study that's working on their design um, and going to be sending out ethics applications to the, I think, 110 labs that are signed up to that one. And the trolley problem, um, which I think is a really interesting one, but they're preparing a registered report for nature human behavior. Um, so I want to finish up with um, something that when I tweeted out the, the link to this talk this morning, Hans Eisenman got right back to me and said, you need to tell them about the Synergy Grant. So I've added a new slide. It's not on the, the public slides. Synergy Grant. Um, we're submitting something to the, I think it's the ERC. Do they do the Synergy? Yeah. Um, <coughs> 
for a four center big project that's all linked up with the PSA. So um, Wagenmachers and Borsboom are going to head the MetaScience um, Center, but then we're planning three other centers that we don't necessarily know who's going to head them. So there's a, um, a form that you can fill out. It's got a really, really long URL. So um, just look at Twitter and Hans Eisenman tweeted the link to it. Um, but you can go look at that, the plan, if you're interested in maybe applying to be a center lead. Um, we have one center about checking the accuracy of our findings, so either planning other types of replications or reanalyses of our existing data in the PSA. Um, one center that's about discovery, so exploratory analyses, or how can we use the data collected um, for, for the specific studies outside of um, the registry report plans. And the fourth one that I think is, is most interesting, but um, they're all interesting, is expanding into non-weird territory. So um, as you probably saw from the map before, we have real good coverage in the US and the UK, mainland Europe. Um, we've got maybe six labs signed up in Africa, 30-something um, East Asian labs. But our, our non-weird reach is not very good yet. Um, We've got maybe 20 in South America now. But um, so we really do want a center, especially I mean, potentially of non psychologists, people who are working in anthropology, to, um, to work to get the PSA resources out to people in, who are working in non weird um, places. Also, if you just personally are really inspired by the PSA and want to give us money because we have no funding at all at the moment, and it's entirely a volunteer organization, we've got a Patreon, um, which we've, yeah, ho hopefully we'll actually get normal grant funding someday. But at the moment, um, I think the costs are just all swallowed by individual members who are, are keen to, um, <coughs> to help out. So, so if anybody's, interested. I was, I was also told, please tweet the Patreon link. Um, and oh, something I wanted to say as well. Um, it might seem like the PSA is just for social psychologists or cognitive psychologists who are doing experimental work and just doing straight replications of previous stuff. And that's really been the, the focus of the first few studies where we try to figure out, like, what are we doing? We should try to do something kind of straightforwardly experimental, straightforwardly replication. Um, but that is not all that the PSA is interested in. If you have something that's not hypothesis testing, we would be interested in that. Really, we're interested in anything that, um, where that could benefit from a large-scale sample in many different countries and many different labs. And that's the, the main criterion if you're writing a proposal. You explain why is it you need this resource? What can this resource do for you that just running the study on 50 undergraduates in your lab can't do? <laughs> So it, it doesn't have to be in any specific area or be hypothesis testing even, as long as you can explain what's the benefit to, to having PSA resources. All right, so um, yeah, if you, want, if you didn't catch any of the slides or links, they're all at that um, site. And thanks very much. <laughs>